Attention everyone. I'm Alaska. And I'm Willem. Lawmakers, Puritans, bigots, and small-minded people are attacking our community and we are ready to fight back. That's right. These conservative politicians are trying to tell the world that drag is bad. Well, we've got news for you. Toots. Drag is is good. good. So we're headed down to Tennessee to the iconic Play Nashville on April 13th to put on a live drag show fundraising event. Featuring us, Eureka O'Hara, Detox, The Meatball, and more. The fundraiser will raise money for the ACLU Drag Defense Fund to fight this legislation in court and mutual aid funds in Tennessee that benefit our queer and trans community who are under attack. For just $10, you can join our live stream and help fight the good fight. Visit moment.co slash drag is good for your live stream ticket. We have to stick together and show the world that trans lives matter. Queer people are everywhere and drag is good. Just between us. If you're looking for a new podcast, might I recommend our podcast? (laughs) Hi, I'm Gabe Dunn. And I'm Allison Raskin. We have a weekly show called Just Between Us, where we explore every kind of topic out there. From mental health, to sexuality, to animal behavior, to science. We love to interview fascinating people about their various expertise. We also answer listener questions and play a very silly game called hypotheticals. You're not going to want to miss it. It's unhinged. (laughs) And if you don't want to trust our word for it because it's our show, you should know that the iHeart Podcast Awards nominated us for Best Ensemble for 2023. That means that we are good at our jobs. Or we have good chemistry. Ooh. Ooh. So check out Just Between Us every Wednesday. Guys, this is Succession. This is HBO. If you don't want to hear me talking about Logan Roy, talking about then don't listen to this. There are bad language words in this show. Hello, and welcome back to the fucking pirates episode of Slate Money Succession. Yes, we can say that word on this show. Um, I am Felix Salmon of Axios. I'm here with my colleague Emily Peck. Hello, hello. I'm here with Elizabeth Spires. Hello. And we have the best person to talk about succession, Claire Malone. Welcome. Hi, good to be here. Claire, introduce yourself. Who are you? Um, I'm a staff writer at The New Yorker covering media and politics. Oh, yes. And, and, what, you, and what you do is you just media gossip, which is basically <laughs> all we do on this show. So... Um, this was intense, man. This was a very complex piece of filmmaking. Uh, my wife, I have to say, loved it. She couldn't stop talking about how wonderful she thought the acting was. Um, Emily, can you give me like the TLDR? Just give me the the, the thirty minute catch up of like try and explain what happened in this episode because it was complicated. Yeah, well, I'll give you the thirty second catch up. That's probably more like a minute. So. The first episode of the season, I came out here on this podcast and I was like, this is great. All the kids are together. They're united. They're the Rebel Alliance, (laughs) as they're told by Connor in this episode. This is the episode where that all falls apart and falls to shit. And basically, Logan warms his way back and breaks up the team. That that would be my TLDR. He he the the sheep that he separates from the flock is Roman. Roman. Yes. And I would also say he he separates Roman. By the end, Roman is like going to be the new leader the new of Sid. ATN, the new Sid. But the mistake he also makes is giving Tom that divorce advice, which sets Shiv off on this like on the notion that she has to bust up the Gojo deal. If he hadn't done that, and if he hadn't screwed with her divorce, the Gojo deal prob I mean, by the conceit of the show, the Gojo deal would have went through and it would have been fine. But no. She had to sort of, like, get back at her father for that, you know? We we open this episode with Shiv going outside in some upstate New York location um, to take a call, being told that all of the lawyers, all of the divorce lawyers in New York have been conflicted out. And we get this incredible facial expression from her where she's just, like, absolutely furious. And we're like, okay, someone is going to wind up cut. And then she gets on the, the gun, gets on the horn with Sandy, female Sandy. So I love how Sandy and Stewie just became 
Sandy and Stewie, but a different Sandy. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. I like them as comic relief a little bit in this episode. Yeah. Just like vultures, basically, but trying even, to get a little even, bit um, extra money. I was thinking in the first episode that uh, Carl and Jerry and why am I forgetting the name of Frank and Frank have also become like, you know, in the Shakespearean tragedy, they're sort of like the clowns. Like they're kind yeah. of always like grouped together now. <laughs> yes. And they're like, I mean, they're doing they're doing real things, but they're also they become more side characters who are doing who are being goofy. Yeah. yeah, and we're getting interesting pairings. It's like Carl and Frank always like are always seen next to each other. Right. Now we get Jerry and Hugo are suddenly <laughs> like hanging out, giggling at Carrie's audition tape. Oh, Carrie's audition tape, so bad! Wow, <laughs> poor Carrie. Does she not know it's bad? That's my question. Everyone wants to break the news to her that it's bad, but I don't think when she you does. do something, she's she's she, really she's very she's she, well. She walks around very confident after she does it, even though everybody's whispering about her behind her back. Yeah. And she seems confused when Greg tries to sit down with her and explain diplomatically that she she needs work. Ah, uh, the Greg diplomacy. <laughs> <laughs> the TV arms, my arms, the TV arms. TV arms. <laughs> <laughs> so we should. Yeah, talk about like the the sort of business conceit yeah. of this show. Yes, let's get serious. Which is that Sandy and Stewie want more money for Waystar Royco from Gojo, and they think that Gojo is underpaying, and that if they just showed a little bit more cojones or backbone or whatever you want to call it, then they could extract more money out of out of Gojo, which. They then have to persuade the kids to get on board because otherwise they don't have remotely enough votes at board level. Um, that pans out as a, um, as a as a motivation for Sandy and Stewie since they're like passive shareholders and they just want to maximize their ROI. Um, it seems pretty obvious that you know the kids are getting. A billion dollars each. If they get one point one billion dollars each, you know, it's like they're not going to. It's it's not such a big deal for them. So if they are going to vote against the deal, it's not what they keep on saying, which is this is just money. It's just a sensible financial decision. Like clearly, it's not clearly. They need their own re- their own sort of personal, familial, Shakespearean. Like the whole theme of the show reasons. is like, what is business and what is an emotional decision, and it's yes. all get, right. it all gets mixed up. And and the scene which I think really sort of stuck with me the most was when Kendall gets that phone call from what's his face at Gojo. The Swede. All they, they all just kept on saying, you want to squeeze the, Madsen? the Swede? Madsen. Madsen. Yeah. Madsen. That's his name. Um, Kendall gets the, uh, a call from Madsen, and Madsen is very clear. He's like, you know, I am not going to pay anymore. If you want to try and negotiate this up, I will go away. And he doesn't do that in a way that seems like um, he's bluffing. It seems like he's telling the truth. And immediately... Kendall's like, okay, now I'm going to start negotiating upwards, which basically says to me that Kendall wants this deal to fall apart. He does not want this deal to happen. Consciously or subconsciously? Consciously, because um, where we left season three was with the three kids desperately trying to make the deal not happen and then being overruled by their dad. Now Kendall has realized that this is a way for him to get what he wanted at the end of season three, which Ooh. was for the deal to not happen. Interesting. And then he can come back, f- find a way back into the... Or whatever. Like, the point The point is that, like, when we... Somewhere between the end of season three and the beginning of season four, the kids kind of came to peace with this idea that the company was going to be sold. They were all going to become billionaires and they should just have to wind up having to do something else. But clearly they at least... Well, not clearly, but in, at least in my reading... Kendall hasn't come to peace with that, and he would still rather not do the deal. So you think he's like an internal saboteur? 
Yeah. Yeah, there was also some tension with Metzen in the last season where they weren't getting along. And I think there was some ego issue there, too. You know, he didn't like being bullied by Metzen. And the tone that Metzen was using with him in that call was very much, you know, putting Kendall in his place. That's how I read it as Kendall just being like, well, no, I just want to fuck this guy over. Kind of <laughs> like I, I didn't think of it, Kendall having any strategic long game and trying to bust up the deal. It was more like I'm just trying to mess with. Matson and prove to him that I can or something. You can't bully me. But you are absolutely right that Shiv's motivations are clear. She's just yeah. really annoyed about the divorce tactics totally. on the part of Tom. Well, she brings it up like three, two or three other times in the show. She she uses it to ro- to tell Roman to get Roman on her side. She's like, look what Dad did to me. And I think she again in the big scene at the end of the show, she brings it up again. Like, yeah, she, and she also, clearly gets really upset speaking of the acting, like her nostrils start flaring and she looks, doesn't she get so like yeah. emotional? Yeah, she also draws a parallel between the way her dad treated their mom and mm. where in, the, in this analogy, Shiv is being treated the same way as one of the, the divorce attorneys. attorneys. Yes. Yeah. Oh, and talking about how Logan treats his ex-wives. <gasps> I know what you're going to say. Say it. He institutionalized Connor's mom? He put her away? He that's, locked her up? That's what they said. That's what they said? Yeah. Where is this woman? I, when no. I was, okay, yeah, that's the first time. The whole, like, Connor, the Connor of it all towards the end, I was like, yeah, we've, oh, wow. We have, Maybe never, we, can... we have never heard about Connor's mom, but, like, is Connor's mom going to turn up at the wedding? I also was wondering, I was like, what's the sort of, um, because they are always kind of making allusions to real world things, and I was like, what is this? Because, like, mm. Rupert's first wife wasn't, like, a ra- like she was like a st- all I know is that she was like a stewardess, an airline stewardess when they first met. But I don't really know what happened to her. What I did think of was like Shelley Miscavige, like yes. the, the Scientology lady. I was like, oh, what's like what's going on? Because it felt very Victorian, like you institutionalized her. Yes. But the Connor of it all was so. I think this episode and the first episode of the season, like R- Roman, has become a little bit of the voice of business reason. Like if Shiv and Kendall are acting emotionally. Roman, who's who's had a lot of interactions with Madsen, right? He feels like he kind of has his temperature. Mm-hmm. Is sort of saying like, "No, I know this." Like yeah. R- Roman has that that mm-hmm. line where he says to Sandy and Stewie, "So we vote yes tomorrow, and we all make billions of dollars, or we vote for your cool shit, and Dad disinherits us entirely." He's like, <laughs> he's he's kind of understood the stakes here in a way yeah. that the other ones but haven't. Totally. Yeah. And what's we so I think the shift if you look at the the arc of the series. The shift of Shiv and Roman, to me, they've kind of completely switched places in my brain to where yeah, yeah. Shiv started out off as sort of like the sympathetic figure and Roman was just like absolutely out there like disgusting. Yeah, he was the fuck up and she was the one who was apparently good at business. And now they've they've totally switched where I feel sort of sympathy both from a practical level and an emotional level for Roman because he's sort of trying to be sensible about the business stuff, empathetic to Connor in his time of need. And Shiv, I mean, last episode, Shiv basically, like, said she was getting divorced to kind of seal a business deal. Like, mm-hmm. I felt like she was wavering before that Nan Pierce conversation. And then she was like, no, I'm getting divorced, you know? And, I, like, I feel like she sort of, sort of totally sold her soul to be part of the the family that I've just seen, like, a, ro- a role reversal. Like, I find Shiv very off-putting now. I think that's right. We have We have some very interesting, genuine... Like character arcs going on. Yeah, here. interesting. I, I think there's been foreshadowing though about Roman coming into this more serious role since season one. Though he has this glib, superficial, you know, surface personality thing, but then there are moments where he's the voice of reason, even even from the beginning. Uh, but they're just escalating now, and I think this is where he finally gets peeled off from the other siblings. Yeah, yeah. Totally. He hasn't been. Shiv's been betrayed, like. In the first or second season, when her father says she's going to run the company and then takes it back. And then in the last season, when Tom, you know, sells her out to her father. So she's been like betrayed twice. So I feel like she's lost. She's lost her ability to love and trust. And I don't think Roman. (laughs) I don't think Roman has. And we know Connor pretends he doesn't need love anymore. But. He well, does. what do we make of he that does. amazing monologue from Connor, which is like, my superpower is that I don't need love. It, it's telling on himself. He 100 percent needs love. Like he begged Willa to marry him. And he's so relieved when he gets home and she's in the bed. He, he does, it. but he, he's also correct whenever he calls the other siblings. He says, you're all love sponges. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're all needy love sponges. And, and you, because he, he's not wrong, you know, and in some way there are each of them, you know, a lot of the decisions that they're making really built around whether they want to screw over Logan 
or get him to love them. Yes. <laughs> yes. And he says, and was that the first time on the show he's Logan has ever said, I love you to the kids? Because he said, I, I don't recall him saying it before. That's a good question. I feel like he's maybe said it before. But what was so interesting to me about the whole setting of him saying, I love you, is that there was an obvious business purpose yeah, for sitting there and saying it. So, like, maybe he meant it, but also, like, well, he'd we been have, forced into a corner yeah, to we, say it. Yeah, we have him, you know, finding out about the kids talking to Sandy and Stewie, and he's sitting in some conference room at ATN, and Kerry's like, do you want me to shout her phone them up and shout at them and he's like and he, you can see the wheels turning and he's like no this one i need to be a bit more subtle and delicate about <laughs> this one i need to go so to that, karaoke that, so, place <laughs> so that was that was subtle and delicate logan that we saw there you know trying to trying to meet them on 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 their ground in in that uncomfortable karaoke spot where you know, Connor had recently been trying to sing a Leonard Cohen song. Oh my Incredible. gosh, the Leonard Cohen was oh so good. Oh my god, good. <laughs> it's a good song. He was doing okay. Was Connor, ha- Connor has a better singing voice than Kendall. Oh, yes, Kendall's yes. Wasn't, Kendall's wasn't terrible. He could like, <laughs> but it's also such a nice touch to have. You know, Connor say something like. I want to go to karaoke. I've seen it in movies. Yes, and it, it's his life is so far removed from any normal persons that just no, we're not normal seems... normal people who like sweat with their hands and bleed from that. What was that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, that was my I that was my quote. That was the, you know, I want a real bar with chicks and guys who work with their hands and sweat from their hands and have blood in their hair. <laughs> <laughs> So good. So and drink good. Belgian vice beer, but not Hogan. <laughs> not Hogan. That was a great line. That was a great line. He's wonderful. I, I did like that the, the the episode ended with Connor getting another dimension. Like he's and that and Alan Ruck is such a good actor because he is he's he's craven and in, in a way too as like all the other siblings are. But he is sweet, right? We have all the details of him like taking the kids on a fishing trip when Logan yeah. wouldn't like being, you know. Being actually a good older brother and like putting up with a lot of abuse from them. My theory is that he had a few years of normalcy with parents. Yeah, be- he yeah. there was must have been a few years where they weren't super billionaire rich family. And yet. Bef- before, before his mother was institutionalized, his mother was sent away. Oh my god! And also, but, but also I want to note um, the turnaround of Willa, who in season one everyone was like. Sh- She's basically a prostitute and we won't talk to her to now where Kendall is saying, Connor, you're not doing better than Willa. Yeah. Like they're like, N- no, this is as good as I it mean, gets the, for you. the three kids who are, we always, always just talk of as the three kids because we always forget Connor. The yeah. three kids are still incredibly rude to Connor. Yes. Right. And Roman is talking about Willa finding some like, you know, young dick. <laughs> and, and I think at one point he calls him Potus Grotus. Yes, he does. <laughs> <laughs> but Connor... Um, you're absolutely right about this, Claire, is now at least elevated to the level of, like, he gets some good lines from the writer's room. Mm. You know, where he's like, I'm a plant that grows on rocks and feasts on insects that grow inside me. It's like... (laughs) (laughs) And all the kids are like, whoa. (laughs) (laughs) It's definitely more than, like, what we had last episode where he's like, you know, I'm afraid if I go below below 1%, I'll be a laughingstock. Right, yeah. That was good, too. I like that, too. (laughs) <laughs> but also, wait, also Connor snitched. I mean, Connor was yeah. like, yeah. Connor's the reason why Logan ends up in the karaoke, in the karaoke room. So yeah. I also was like, oh, Connor's like everyone's kind of showing their motivations here. Right. Like the pe- the characters who were behind the scenes, like Carrie. Oh, now we know what Carrie wants. Carrie wants to be on TV. We know Connor needs more money for the campaign. So he like wants to he wants the deal to go through. I kind of liked that there was a little bit of like Connor, Connor, like lightly getting into play. Let's have a quick ad break and then talk about Kerry and whether it makes any sense that she wants to be on TV. It's time to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. You work hard for your money, so you should be able to spend it on the things you actually want. With Apple Card, you can kiss fees goodbye. There aren't and never will be any annual foreign transaction late or over the limit fees. Not even hidden ones. Apply now on the Wallet app on iPhone and start using it right away. Subject to credit approval, late or missed payments will result in additional interest accumulating toward your balance. Variable APRs for Apple Card range from 15.49% 
to 26.49% based on creditworthiness. Rates as of March 1st, 2023. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, when you're listening, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something you can be doing right now. Getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy and you could save money by doing it right now from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $700 on average. And auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $698 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. Attention everyone. I'm Alaska. And I'm Willem. Lawmakers, Puritans, bigots, and small-minded people are attacking our community and we are ready to fight back. That's right. These conservative politicians are trying to tell the world that drag is bad. Well, we've got news for you, toots. Drag Drag is is good. good. So we're headed down to Tennessee to the iconic Play Nashville on April 13th to put on a live drag show fundraising event. Featuring us, Eureka O'Hara, Detox, The Meatball, and more. The fundraiser will raise money for the ACLU Drag Defense Fund to fight this legislation in court and mutual aid funds in Tennessee that benefit our queer and trans community who are under attack. For just $10, you can join our live stream and help fight the good fight. Visit moment.co slash drag is good for your live stream ticket. We have to stick together and show the world that trans lives matter, queer people are everywhere, and drag is good. good. So as the media reporter, Claire, can you, does, does this idea that Kerry wants to be on TV strike you as remotely plausible like she has this unbelievably powerful de facto number two position at the top of atn she's in all the meetings she gets to you know shout at anyone she wants and she's like no i want to like demote myself 18 levels to become an anchor it is very strange also she's i mean how old do we think carrie is She's not like a young, like young woman. Late twenties, I would say. I think she's in her thirties. I think early thirties. Yeah, because that's so. I was also like, you know, she's not like, she's not like a young bumpkin. Like she's, um, and also like to become to become a Fox News personality. Like TV news is so you got to go up through the farm leagues. You got to yeah. do local news. You have to like present yourself. Um, also, weirdly, I've I noticed because of Carrie's audition tape. I was like, there's not a lot of blondes. They're all, I mean, Shiv is obviously like the strawberry blonde exception. But a lot of the women, like, you know, it's it's a lot of, you know, brunettes. Like, there's not a lot of, I guess, wait. On ATN? Yeah. Like, That's have we weird. Seen, That's have very we seen un-thoughts. a lot of, maybe I'm, maybe I'm like not recalling this well. But I was also struck by like, Carrie has like blunt across bangs and like brown hair. And there was just something very C-sweet about her look and not like, be on TV, you know. She's she's kind of the the look even was off to me. Like she looked strange in a pink dress. She she's always looked strange, right? That haircut is deliberately strange on some mm-hmm. level. Yeah, yeah, it's very harsh and yeah severe. And not TV anchor. It's not, no. it's not <laughs> no. like some like classic TV blow dry. I mean, for a start, I think if you're a TV anchor, and I don't cover media, but I think you have to be able to read clearly off a cue card. <laughs> And she did it. It was so funny. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't think it's. Pl- I don't think it's plausible. I think probably Logan knows it's not plausible. He knows. Yeah, that was uh, his conversation with Tom, where he doesn't say that. You know, you and need to tell just, Carrie. Kind of they just an like eyebrow. look at each other. <laughs> that was incredible. I was yeah. like, would I get this message? I don't know. Like, I, know. I need to be told things. And when when the uh, when the kids <laughs> say to her. 
you've had your betrayal cherry popped, you know, and she, <laughs> that was like, a, that was a great, that was a great bit of like sort of facial acting from her. But I, I am kind of curious about the writer's room decision to do like, why not elevate her to more of like the advisor track instead of, but, but do because, the, because we the, already have, you know, the Frank and Jerry and like you know, adding another person at that level doesn't also help. wait, but if they're rejiggering, ATN to be uh, more like fucking pirates. Like, and Carrie obviously didn't react well to <laughs> to Greg's uh, feedback. What, what's she going to do to Maybe, him if the focus group doesn't exist? Peel him like a string cheese? <laughs> <laughs> Take him apart like a human string cheese, which you did kind of think, well, he is a human string cheese. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a good line. But maybe she could still find a way to maneuver herself onto the new ATN. Like maybe the storyline really isn't going Yeah, I thought going maybe away. part of the, the plot point that she wanted to be on TV and then would be sort of humiliated by her own performance was a way of knocking her down a peg because she sort of, w- without really establishing it very much, became an advisor to Logan and, you know, sort of tries to punch above her weight mm-hmm. a lot in a way that's a little bit grating. So when Greg confronts her, and it's it feels awkward to hear him confront her, you know, she says she dismisses him entirely, partly because he's Greg, but also because she thinks that she has a better handle on what Logan wants than anybody else. Well, I, I think she, at least when we saw her in episode one, like really controlling the birthday party, had definitely stepped into the role that we that Marsha had in season one. Yeah. Right? Yes. And no one has had that job. No one's had that kind of um, spouse slash business partner partner position. Yeah. And and Carrie's yeah. And this is why I'm like that is that is a great job to have if you're Carrie. It does not make sense that you want to be talent. No. Yeah. You have you have so much less power. Like now you're putting yourself at the mercy of the underlings that you. Yeah. And, and it was Kerry, by the way, who had that amazing line last last episode about oh, Marsha's gone shopping in Milan <laughs> forever. forever. <laughs> All the women just disappearing. I know. Ooh. It's really true. I, I was very sad that Marsha didn't come back because I loved Marsha so much. And yes. I really, after season one, I was like, please bring back Marsha. But um, I am happy that Sid is back because Sid is amazing. Well, we I haven't really seen long. much of her yet. Well, we don't know how long she's back. We if have to dig fired. in. We have to dig in now to the visit to ATN. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, Logan's like Henry V moment. <laughs> yes, he gets up on the boxes, which um, I remember when Rupert Murdoch took over the journal. I was there, and he also stood on the boxes. It was it's a like classic the same Rupert thing. Ma- yeah, it was a 100% total Murdoch Rupert Murdoch thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, and he gets up, and he... I was like, yeah, Logan, yeah. Like, I was into it. If I had been in the newsroom, I would have been like, yeah, I'm a pirate. So spicy. Like, so true. We didn't get that news. I'm going to make them turn around in their cars or whatever he said. I love that the boxes also made Logan exactly Tom's height. <laughs> <laughs> they had Tom stand next to him. It's lucky Greg wasn't there. He would have towered over both of them. Uh, <laughs> so good. I loved it because it, it was like just as media people, you know, you get the business guy stands up and he's like, we're up. What did you say? We're up. Five percent for the quarter, or something like that. Three percent week on week in the like, demo. Who cares? Yeah, exactly. fifteen. <laughs> it was perfect. It was so good. And Logan understood like that. No one is motivated by this or cares. Um, and the real life parallel of that is after Fox sells to Disney, oh. Rupert spends. Rupert ends up sp- and Roger Ailes leaves Fox in a in a in a cloud of <laughs> that we all remember. I think Rupert then. When they when they spin the two companies away from each other, Fox New Fox and um, News Corp, I think Rupert ended up spending a lot of time at Fox News after Ailes left. Mm-hmm. So when he yeah, says yeah. like Ru- I'm going to be here, yeah. like I think that that's supposed to be like ab- Rupert post Ailes. You're absolutely mm-hmm. right. Like um, the the replacement for Roger Ailes was Rupert, Rupert Murdoch, Murdoch. <laughs> which everyone was incredibly happy about. Yeah, but. He, yeah, but didn't seem to have much make much of a difference in the run up to 2020 or anything. You know what I mean? Well, I mean, you know, on some level, Rupert can do things that no one else can do, right? When when um, when Logan gets up on his pieces of paper and says <laughs> and and says like, you know, I want us to be reporting the stuff that no one else is willing to report, and basically gives not just the green light, but an order to go, you know, and push those like journalistic ethical 
envelopes and to you know blow them up to smithereens we're fucking pirates like that is you know he does it in a really compellingly charismatic way and he does it in a way that like if sid said that it wouldn't work you need to be logan in order to do that right give people permission to uh say the spicy stuff the fucking pirates line I just like cackled. That was the one. It's not even like it's not like the cleverest line, but just the delivery. I was like, this this is such a funny moment. And also to bring the media reporting back in, my mind right now is so in the Dominion trial, Fox trial that's going to start in two weeks. And so much of this to me was, you know, after the insurrection happened in January 2021, and some, you know, Fox Fox was some, you know, some reporters were sort of saying like this is what really happened here's yeah. the truth and now we know through all these through all the discovery in this lawsuit that the executives were freaking out about ratings and saying we need to offer them comfort food to me this is kind of like what fox actually did after january 6 which is like just like lean more into the hardcore yeah. like tucker became more and more tucker more and more right wing like when when logan says we're going to be fucking pirates and it's going to be spicy i think that's sort of meant to be like the the new era of Fox News. Also, who's the who's the candidate now for the GOP? The, the, the young Nazi, racist guy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can't remember his name. It's it sounded like it's like not Mengele, but it's <laughs> yeah, it was like that. Sounded like it. Yeah. Mencken or something. Mencken. Mencken. Yeah. Mencken. Yeah. But Mencken is like you know the sort of like neo Nazi guy, mm-hmm. and they were gonna. I think they're sort of gonna try to remake ATN or in that. That model. And he's going to bring Roman in, and, and Roman, bring Roman in. So, kind so he of does discovered have discovered Mencken in yeah. a way, right. and he does have yeah. So Roman has fascist tendencies, you know, <coughs> and <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean seriously. Yeah, I, no, no, yeah. that's definitely the yeah. So the, the Rupert, the Rupert is to Roman. So Rupert is to Lachlan as Logan is to Roman. Because Lachlan is supposedly more, much right, more right wing. Kendall, yeah. Yeah. Kendall is to Roman. No. Like the the it's the it's the Rupert Lucklin relationship, right? Oh, Where Rupert okay. Rupert is slightly more realist. Like he supports Tony Blair if that's going to do him well in the UK. Whereas oh, id, basically. whereas Lucklin is like the actual right wing true believer. Yes. Um, and what you have at the end is Logan really understanding the news business and saying to Roman and saying to Roman. You are not Pierce. You know, you can buy Pierce, yeah. but this is not you. This just does not fit with who you are. And you, what's the actual word he uses? He's, he's like, you, you're not Pierce. Smart people know what they are. Yeah. And he's like, if you come here and you take over the newsroom and, like, I can see that pirate in you. Because there is an element of pirate to Roman, totally. right? Um, clearly, um, Roman is a better fit at... ATN than he than he would be at PS. And what is also obvious is that Logan understands TV news. He understands TV journalists. He understands how to get them up and motivate them. Meanwhile, you know, we have that scene at the beginning of the episode where Kendall's watching PGN oh and God. saying a show about politics called Inside Baseball. How fucking confusing is that? <laughs> <laughs> and like none of them have a clue. And he's like, "We let's let's do like Sub-Saharan East and Sub-Saharan <laughs> West." And like they're all morons. And like you know, all they can come up with is Substack meets Masterclass meets The Economist meets New Yorker. Right? They can't <laughs> come up with anything smart. They have no idea how to commit news, mm-hmm. especially not on a sort of for-profit basis. And Logan is in his blood. He knows how to do it. And it's the Fox yeah. News. There's from his quote, he said, um, so spicy, so true. Something everyone knows, but no one says because they're too fucking lily livered. That's like, yeah. say the racist thing. That's what that means. But to it's, me. it's also the classic Nick Denton thing, right? He's like, mm. I want Gorka to be the stuff that everyone says in the bar yes. after work. Yes. And look where that got him. Too. <laughs> well, <laughs> for 14 years it went pretty well. Pretty well, legend. It worked yes. until it didn't. Yeah. But that's what that was the message when when Logan said it. That's all I was thinking was just like, oh, the permission to be racist, basically. Right, which is actually what the New York Post is doing right now. You know, if it, like the the New York Post has gone full like anti-trans and like really sort of like weird right now. There is like yeah, I mean, I was watching that again. I was thinking like, what is the conservative media turned into during the Biden years? And it's like everything 
is now hooked to that's woke. So like when Silicon Valley Bank fell apart, they were like, it's the diversity, equity and inclusion people's fault. Like Silicon Valley Valley Bank was like, you know, a, a, a victim of wokeism, not with, like the with, actual with technical its, explanation. So with, like, with its executive team who was all white men. But yeah. <laughs> but I feel like 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 to me, that's what I was like. Oh, yeah, this is kind of what Fox does or like what these other conservative satellite channels and networks do. It's like everything is about like is sort of the knee jerk. Uh, contrarian argument. And that's what ATN's thing is going to be. It's like yeah. the mainstream thing is that here's the thing that is like a little bit a little bit funny. Right. Like like tr- like Trump is actually a little bit funny when he's, you know, on one. That's, I think, what they're kind of aiming for. The um, the line at the beginning that foreshadows this weirdly is Roman when he's talking to the his his two siblings about what they're going to do with PGN. And he says, prime time, we go full clockwork orange. (laughs) Which, like, you don't go full clockwork orange on PGN, but you totally can on ATN. Like, that would work, right? And that's actually what Fox does, right? In prime time, they go full clockwork. That's, that's, um, what's his face with the bow tie? Tucker. Tucker. Yeah. What's his face with the bow tie? (laughs) Yeah, Tucker's. um, He's gone full clockwork orange. Oh, yeah. And, like, you know, texting with Lachlan, you know? We should have another break, but when we come back, I want to talk about this Gojo deal and whether it's going to happen and basically what is coming up for the rest of this season. If you're looking for a new podcast, might I recommend our podcast? (laughs) Hi, I'm Gabe Dunn. And I'm Allison Raskin. We have a weekly show called Just Between Us, where we explore every kind of topic out there. From mental health, to sexuality, to animal behavior, to science. We love to interview fascinating people about their various expertise. We also answer listener questions and play a very silly game called hypotheticals. You're not going to want to miss it. It's unhinged. (laughs) And if you don't want to trust our word for it because it's our show, you should know that the iHeart Podcast Awards nominated us for Best Ensemble for 2023. That means that we are good at our jobs. Or we have good chemistry. Ooh. Ooh. So check out Just Between Us every Wednesday. Hi, I'm Frances Fry. And I'm Ann Morris. And we are the hosts of a new TED podcast called Fixable. We've helped leaders at some of the world's most competitive companies solve all kinds of problems. On our show, we'll pull back the curtain and give you the type of honest, unfiltered advice we usually reserve for top executives. Maybe you have a coworker with boundary issues, or you want to know how to inspire and motivate your team. No problem is too big or too small. Give us a call and we'll help you solve the problems you're stuck on. Find Fixable wherever you listen to podcasts. I want to ask about the like the deal, like our prediction for the deals and everything. Like, what happens with if Gojo drops out, if th- that deal falls apart, yeah. and Kendall's maybe to go with your theory, Felix, Kendall's maybe like working to to sabotage it from within. What happens with the Pierce sale? Like, what? Like, well, there's what's, no Pierce sale. So, clearly. so everything is just kind of like we're we're back to the original yeah, season we're, one. We're, yeah, like, season one, episode one. We're back. Right. Like, we're kind of clearing the slate no. a little bit. Is that what no. this moment <laughs> is that? But is that what this moment's supposed to be? No. It's so kind one, of like, one of the one of the thing one of my sort of overarching theses about Succession is that nothing ever actually happens. Like, yeah. like, yeah. My like season two. When we start season two, the big cliffhanger is like, there's this proxy battle and who's going to win the pro- proxy battle. When we end season two, the big cliffhanger is, there's this proxy battle and who's going to win, <laughs> win the proxy battle. Like, the, like, the, the actual corporate stuff that happens in succession is almost nothing. There's a lot of talk about, we're going to buy Pierce, we're going to sell to Gojo, we're going to have, you know, we're going to lose the proxy ballot battle to Stewie. But like... It ne- nothing ever Logan's, actually happens. But Logan's going to die. I mean, I haven't seen any more of the episodes, but this is well, my he's prediction. Not step he's down voluntarily. Yeah, he's They're like, not- you know, you've got a musing about mortality on episode one. And if like, if the only way anything is going to change is if, to me, it's like if this guy goes away. Yeah, like, which is, away, but right? I think, I think nothing's going to change. I think we're, we're going to end without any 
fundamental change to the corporate structure of anything. Um, <laughs> although I have to share, I fully disagree. I have Ooh, to share. I you. have to share the. Um, all right, what what you think we're going to actually have an event? It's going to happen. Well, I I believe I've heard the show's creator tell me his name. Jesse Armstrong. Jesse, Jesse Armstrong, I believe, has said we can't call the show Succession and not have it pay off. I yeah. someone has said that, so I think it's going to pay off somehow. I feel like they put a lot of work into setting up this ATN spinoff, especially yeah. in this episode. So it would be weird to me if that doesn't happen. And it seems like I don't haven't done the vote. I don't. I haven't whipped the votes, so I don't know how many <laughs> votes are needed. But um, it, it does seem like Roman's not going to vote. You know, he's going to vote with his father. Yeah. So well, there was that last board meeting. You know, with the no yeah, confidence well, he, vote where Roman puts yeah. his hand back down. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so I kind of feel like maybe the Gojo sale does happen i'm not we don't have to bet money well in the credits it, but we, you know we how could. in the credits it used to be there was like an atn anchor like talking on tv yeah now in the credits there's a little phone with like an app like a <gasps> streaming app so i'm Ooh, like oh well maybe the season that. is all about like the streaming app again that's the credits <laughs> I <love> that. <laughs> um good. i i should i should jump in here and and talk about my my favorite theory about what happens in this season which i got from a certain um Eighth Avenue kitchen appliance on Twitter, which um, <laughs> which which is that none of the three kids are Roman's biological children. Logan's biological children. Right. What, what, Wait. What? That if they if they find out that like. <laughs> That's like Days of Our Lives meets Succession. <laughs> <laughs> They're actually his twins. So wait. So who's like. Who's are they? <laughs> They're what? just like people, like They're random. Just... And that, that's like that gives that gives Logan the ability to just like disinherit a lot of them, basically. I think he dies. That's wild. Theory. I think he dies, and that's like so. Wild. I listen. I listened to the last episode, and when Jim Stewart mentioned, or maybe you, you guys mentioned at the end, the like the theory of what could pot- potentially happen when Rupert dies, and mm-hmm. like okay, if this season is building towards yes, the deal, but also like a, an election. Like, what if things get too crazy at ATN and the siblings decide, like, we can't let, I guess, Roman run it in this crazy way. We're going to try to take it over and turn it more Pierce. I don't know. Like, something about the, mm. like, does does anything get too crazy on ATN and, like, a like will there be a January 6th type incident? Mm. Maybe Naomi Pierce takes over ATN. Naomi Pierce. <laughs> I, man. <laughs> Like Kendall's Maybe. personal life, like what happens? I, I just, there's so many loose ends that I'm kind of like, how are they going to tie all this up for me? In yeah, did they ever actually break up? It just sort of petered out or something. I can't remember. Party I can't remember. Yeah, how did it end? He like yells. He... I don't know. Yeah, I don't remember. I'm oh sure. oh oh, um, Kendall and Naomi. Yeah, how did they? Yeah, end? They, they just you know fizzled. Roman is he actually divorced now? I mean, Kendall is he divorced now? Is he like in the process of getting divorced? Oh yeah, he's. I think divorced. he's divorced. He's, he's divorced. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Kendall might die. Sorry, I shouldn't. I I just stick to the episode, <laughs> but now I'm just thinking like I feel like someone has to like. This show has toyed so much with like. Kendall's life. Yeah. That I kind of feel like something happens with either Kendall or Logan. But like in a immediate, Deus Ex Machina kind of way. But the, but the immediate question is like, what happens tomorrow? Because we have um, Logan saying that he wants to jet off to meet Madsen with Roman, yeah. um, and also, you know, on Connor's wedding day. Like Connor, come on, are you really going to schedule your wedding day for the day the deal's supposed to close? <laughs> Do we think anything's going to happen with Connor's presidential bid? Like Especially given, if, if, if a, no, but if ATN goes in this direction where, you know, it, it does seem to be building toward oh, an electoral yeah. scenario. There, there is I literally no way. Aww. Like, remember how Connor keeps on trying to persuade Logan to, like, you know, support him mm. on ATN. And Logan's just like, you are a fucking yeah, doofus. No. There's no way. No. You are not serious people. You are not serious people. Devast- exactly. Tr- true. True. And <laughs> devastating. Truer words. Wait, so so... The, the episode ends with with Logan saying he's going to delay the vote, right? Or yes. is and that so they're going to go basically calm Madsen down. Right? Delaying the vote though, that's I don't think Madsen's going to like that, and he didn't even call me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he called everyone else. He, did. he was buttering him up, right? When he says like all the people I respect don't get enough sleep, sleep. I yeah. was like, he doesn't respect Kendall. Come no. on, he's just right. he's just trying to flatter him. 
But he's also like sitting there in his nightshirt being a little bit like up late at night. Because remember, he's in like Italy, right? He's in his like it's villa in, yeah, in yeah, like yeah. Como or whatever. He's in Sweden or wherever it is. Like Gojo is a European company and it's already, what is it, like 10 p.m. or something at, yeah. in, in New York. So he's clearly just being insomniac at this point. Yeah. Yeah, I was trying to figure out like, was his call strategic or was it just like unhinged a little bit? You know, it was unhinged strategic. Unhinged strategic. I think it was too, because like, isn't part of dealing with Madsen is like they're they're so used to dealing with like Wall Street types, mm. and he's a totally different tech type, but also weirdly unreadable in a way of like, is it strategic? Is it just like his odd affect? Is he Elon Musk? <laughs> is he like is he, yeah? Like is he but, just but a Logan, narcissist? Right? Like, yeah. yeah. Logan is much. It's like openly rude about him um, at this point, which is interesting because like. You know, he wants to s- sell his company. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's he not. thinks maybe. that dealing with Matson is beneath him. He doesn't view him as a peer, and that's yeah. At least not the way that he does the Pierces or you know more established. Now I'm feeling like the deal's not going to go through. I don't I think it to... will. I really no, don't I'm think sti- it will. No, I'm sticking with it. What I said. You it's think good. it is going to go through? So what's then? What's the complication? for the rest of the season if the deal goes We were only two episodes in. That's <laughs> There's lots of stuff to, to do and yeah. talk about. There's divorce drama. Okay, so, all right, first of I, all... What happens at ATN? Does the wedding happen out? tomorrow? Wow. I, I think, yeah. We're, yeah. She was in the bed. She's going to go through with it. And right? But something yeah. weird will happen. At, like... Isn't it supposed to be like a spectacle in the in like at like the Statue of Liberty yeah, or something? I, yeah, yeah like, no, I feel like Will is not going to put up with with that. She has a bit of... Far. <laughs> it all feels so real. <laughs> but Will is, I think, you know, Will is oh beginning. Like, yeah, she's she's obviously having her like last minute wobbles, which a lot of you know brides to be have and grooms to be. Like that's you can't normal. be jumping for joy the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. I mean, what's that? What's that wonderful line from from kind of fuck? She's in the East River. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, she's on the bridge. <laughs> Yeah, that was a great exchange between Connor and Shiv where he's like, it's a factory setting. She's, it's not. Because <laughs> he's, you know, doing the find my on his phone for her. It's it's not. <laughs> but yeah, she like, you know, she she knows what to do. She just goes into the bathroom for 40 minutes, disappears off, has a few drinks in Williamsburg and comes back and prepares herself for the she, big day tomorrow. She also got, I don't know if you guys noticed this, much more blonde and mm-hmm. much more like her aesthetic is much more political wife now. Yes. Like she's really, le- they're really rich. leaning into it, you know, yeah. like clothing wise, yeah. appearance wise. She looks like she fits in now. That's what I was, exactly. yeah, that's trying to say before. Like she's like, her arc is like fully converted to the billionaire side. Like she can't just walk away from this now. Yeah. Meanwhile, like, like her little friends on the stairs look so different from her, you know? Capricious bag. The, the big, <laughs> like, I guess it's a, Rehearsal dinner is the yeah. night before the wedding, right? Yeah. yeah. Is it seems to be Willa, her gaggle of female friends who went to the bathroom with her, the three siblings who turn up late because the helicopter was cancelled, and Connor and no one else, just sitting at like one table in the middle of the Four Seasons, <laughs> um, and and like that's you know that's just like the the that shot of Connor sitting at that big circular table with no one else at the table just feeling completely friendless and alone where was Logan did Logan ever show up to that yeah why didn't Logan show up to that he just doesn't care I guess yeah he wasn't there he went to ATN instead yeah, yeah was... Roman reminds him that the wedding is the next day, and Logan's like, eh, well, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at ATN. By the way, what was the thing, I, and I can't remember the line where Tom is like, tell me every, when Logan's like walking around the floor, and Tom is like, tell me everything that he's doing, Greg, with his face. Oh, and he's like, best. it's like if Jaws, what is it? Like if Jaws. It's like Jaws, it's... everyone in Jaws worked, worked for, for Jaws. Jaws. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. He's just terrifyingly moseying. It looks as if Santa Claus was a hitman. Yeah. <laughs> so good. He's just kind of walking around, but with a slight sense that he might kill someone. Oh, and he and Logan when he's peering over the sh- the shoulder of one of the yeah um, the poor employees 
He uses I I like like he basically calls him an apparatchik, but uses a better word for it. Stacavanite. Yes, stacavanite. Yeah, I was, was going to ask what is what does that mean? Oh, stacavanite means um, basically he's being sarcastic, right? Like so a Soviet like the the idea the Soviet ideal was of this stacavanite worker. I think Stakhanov was this famous worker who was like um, you know could do the work of a hundred men and that kind of thing and everyone needs to be a stacavanite and work very hard and he's just like he, all you're doing is drafting a single email and that's all you've been doing the whole time I'm here you know he's a fucking stacavanite over here <laughs> but it was funny because like Logan's so obviously displeased with ATN or maybe performatively performatively displeased right but right. then he gets up and makes the crazy speech which is why it's such a good moment because you're like he starts off as Jaws and he ends up as like I don't know. <laughs> it, it is it is very weird to me the way in which Logan veers wildly from like almost dead and or like having his sort of kinglier like yeah. you know UTI episode <laughs> to being you know to being like as I say like Henry the Fifth and being like this great like, leader of men and incredible charismatic you know only competent person and I do feel like that's a hard act for the show to pull off like they can't quite work out whether he's mentally all there or not he clearly was in this episode yeah yeah it's like a back and forth and then yeah he's got to die by the end right i think so yeah (laughs) it's just like they got to pay that off someone has to die (laughs) like in every great tv show someone has to die someone has to die it's just like how are they it's to me it's more how many episodes like 12 episodes it's ten. like ten. Okay, are they going to have like a Sopranos esque ending? Is it going to be? Sounds like he wants to make it more satisfying, like a more. I hope it's a little bit fan service. I don't want Sopranos ending, but I don't need it to be six feet under and literally everyone die. Yeah, I, I just think it'll be. Six feet I think it'll be fan. Okay. Su- I think it'll be fan service. Like it, it seems like they have a good. Like it's like whenever you're writing a piece and you're like you write the piece, blah blah blah, and then you're like, fuck, how do I end it? And like I think they've, and that's I think they've thought through the ending. Like yeah. I think they probably, in the writers' room, started being like, "Okay, how does this end?" Yeah, right. Because you kind of have to. Well, the payoff comment makes it seem like they want a tight resolution. That's that's very clear. I think so. There's a slight chance I've made that up in my head. The payoff comment. <laughs> Someone has said it. No, I think it sounds. I think it sounds right. Yeah. Like he. <laughs> I actually here, maybe here's the plug. I think he did an interview in the New Yorker with uh-huh. uh, with us. So, but I I don't remember what he said about <laughs> pay off. So I'm a bad employee. So we need. I want to talk a little bit just in terms of like television about the back to back multiplayer scenes, like the first one in the bar with the four children, and then the second one in the karaoke um, spot with the four children plus Logan plus Kerry. Um, both of which were just incredibly complex in their sort of choreography and their writing um, and full of the kind of thing that you can only do when people have been watching, you know, 30 plus hours of this show already and they know these characters and you can convey things with just like, you know, a raised eyebrow. And it's... It, for me, like this is this is where the all of the sort of golden age of television stuff really comes into its own. That, that you you know you can't do that in a movie because you don't have enough time to develop the characters in that kind of way, and and you don't have a ten hour season that you have the luxury of being able to spend probably what was like fifteen minutes just on those two scenes, mm-hmm. and and they're just beautifully written and beautifully like emotionally acted, and yeah, like well done, you guys. But it's even like I I rewound a couple of times because I, I watched this like late last night and I was like when when Shiv – when they have the kind of like uh, Stewie is like waiting outside in the car and he's sort of like pretending to be like a, a taxi driver and then they have the, the conversation where I think it's the first time that they give you the details of how they think the price is misaligned, like they're paying too much. Yeah. And I was like, wait – did I miss the like did I miss like why Shiv wants specifically to do this deal? So I rewound and I was like, no, you're just supposed to know that like she has this emotional reaction. She calls Sandy, female Sandy, and it starts this chain reaction. And then they explain the details to you, mm-hmm. which was so interesting to me because I was like, in some ways, like to what you're saying, Felix, it's like you can only do that if it's like this is we had 
we had a bunch of deal talk the first episode and the rest of this episode is going to kind of unspool it for you. But it was, I was it, not that it was confusing, but I was like, I did feel like, oh, did I miss something? You know, or like how much should I know about why she wants to do this? It felt it felt subtle in a way that is kind of golden age of television. Yeah, I think it's it's written with the assumption that the audience is so invested in this show, which it, it, which they are. You know, it, yeah. it definitely has that kind of following that they'll wait to reveal things that, you know, a lot of viewers would not really sit with right. on other shows. Right. The same thing with um in the previous episode, the reason and I didn't really like cotton to this when we when I watched it. The reason Logan was so out of sorts or one reason was because the kids weren't there and and like that was upsetting to him right. and it, and they pay it off in in this in this episode when he literally just says that out loud and and you know it's true like you saw how he was and he really did miss his kids yeah but they didn't feel the need to make that the, ki- like, the spell kids it out for everyone. yeah no the kids definitely were you know deeply upset at the end of season three because they had tried to prevent this deal and they thought they could and then they discovered that they couldn't because Logan had done this deal with their mom. Um, but Logan, like from his point of view, was just like doing a deal with their mom, mom and getting his deal through. And that's what he does, right? He didn't do it to fuck off the kids. He didn't do it to estrange the kids. He right. wants those kids by him. And when you know, Roman texts him. He's like, this is great. And then, like, the minute that Roman shows any sign that he might be willing to talk, he's like, come on in. I'm going to put you in charge. You know, I love you guys. Yeah. And I think that's probably real. Yeah. And, and, um, I, oh, and when, uh, Shiv was like, you know, how dare you do that thing with, you know, conflicting out all the lawyers? He's, I think he's absolutely right. It's like, if you, if you'd asked me, I'd have given you the same advice. Yeah. Which is a little kooky, if you ask me. You have to pick a side. Right, and in the divorce, if you're the father of yeah, the person getting divorced, disingenuous, it wasn't to a, get it. You have to pick. No, a side. But, okay. So but he was question. trying to punish you, her for not being there. Definitely. You know, he's saying, yeah, yeah, I, I'm I, here, I, and that's why you didn't get that advice. And the helicopter yeah. move. I mean, oh yeah, the helicopter move was. was I was just. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love the pettiness of some of the slights mm-hmm. when when there's conflict. The the writers do a great job of coming up with the the most incredible minor petty way <laughs> that they wage war against each other. Uh, Completely. Yeah. Yeah. Axe that chopper. They can fucking walk. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a, a real life. There's a real life corolla- corollary too now, right? Because Sofia Coppola's daughter. She oh got my in god! Trouble that, yes. For, for trying, trying to, to book a helicopter to, to see her camp friend in Maryland, <laughs> and that was kiboshed by her parents. So it's a very similar. They, story. they grounded her. It's basically the same. <laughs> it's the same story. It's basically exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> Literally grounded her. <laughs> um. What f- favorite lines, people? Um, Elizabeth, do you have like a favorite line? Yeah, mine really was the uh, Greg's. It's like Jaws. If everyone in Jaws worked for Jaws, <laughs> and then he asks, you know, Tom. So he's he's Logan's just going to be hanging around now, and Tom says, "Yep, hanging around like the threat of nuclear war." <laughs> <laughs> that was a good line. Wonderful. I liked this one because I'm going to use it the next time I have to apologize. <laughs> apologize. I'm going to say, look. I don't do apologies, but if it means so much to you, then sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that I heard and was like, that is literally something that they say on Real Housewives. Like, Logan is a housewife. Incredible apology. Just Incredible. No notes. Um, the line that made me laugh the most was the fucking pirates line. But, and I, and I, and I, I like the Jaws line too. But I did think that the line that they teased in the trailer when Greg and Tom are talking and they're like about Carrie's audition tape and how they're in a teller and Tom says it's like Israel and Palestine, but much more delicate and much more important. (laughs) 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 That's really great. Um, I I don't know. There were there there were. I, I think my favorite one is that I'm a plant that grows on rocks, rocks and feasts on insects that grow inside me. But there was also that throwaway line from Logan at the end, which was so good, where he's like, this city, the rats are as fat as, as, fat as skunks. It's like... <laughs> they don't even run anymore. They don't even run anymore. Yeah, they barely feel the need to run anymore. It's just like... <laughs> That, oh. He was so angry because he knew everyone was mad at him. Carrie's mad at him. The kids are mad at him. He's kind of like in a desolate place. Yeah. And then he calls Roman. And Marsha is off shopping Marsh- in Milan forever. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> forever. He's got to get her back. 
Wait, what, what was the line you picked? I had a thought about it. I wanted to bring Israel, it. Palestine. Oh, it, the fact that it was such delicate diplomacy just reminded me of how much it sucks to be a manager or a boss because I feel like half the work is doing that, breaking news to people in delicate ways that doesn't offend them. That is quite literally the work of most bosses most of the time. Or an editor when they're yes. like, lots of good stuff Lots here. of good stuff. <laughs> but good I stuff. think you're going to need to rewrite it. <laughs> so, okay. I mean... Really good job. Lots of good stuff. As as a you know, former boss who had to do that kind of thing, Emily. Yes. What what grade would you give Greg for what for his uh, diplomacy? I mean, I actually want to hear what Elizabeth says, so I'll go quick. I would give him like a but yeah, I would give him like a like a C minus to a D. It was pretty bad. Totally unclear, sort of clear. But... Well, Kerry got the message. <laughs> I, I think uh, for a first timer who was given absolutely no direction from he got Tom, direction like from Tom. Tom told him not what to do. really. I mean, he he basically you know normally if you had a first time manager and they had to fire someone or deliver bad news, you would prep them and tell them exactly what to say. And Tom was just like, "Hey, oh, you can do it." But his, <laughs> but Tom's strategy was good. Yeah, I was like, "Oh, you mapped out this conversation." Like, yeah. I mean, I think we forget Tom like worked worked and slept his way to the top. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. he's he's no dummy. Yeah, he actually has experience. Yeah, he's a man. I mean, working. I was like, oh, he's a manager. He's like <laughs> Yeah, no, Tom exactly. It's kind of impressive that, you know, it's Tom on one side and Sid on the other and Logan and Tom's like, Can I kiss you or whatever? Like <laughs> <laughs> But Tom you know, even after his marriage has fallen apart, is still actually important at ATN. He still has a real job. Yeah, yeah that's interesting. He he managed to do it. He pulled it off. He doesn't have one of those like fake jobs like Roman had. The disgusting yeah. brothers are running ATN. <laughs> I guess maybe even Greg has a real job yeah. at this point. Yeah. yeah. And and if he you know if it doesn't work out, he's the fallback is the Buffalo. The Buffalo job. Oh, but not anymore because the deal's going to go through. Oh, the theme park. Uh, the theme park. Yeah, yeah he's he big can in always just go and run the theme park in Buffalo. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. No, you should. Yeah, we need more theme park content. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so predictions for next episode. Obviously, the it'll be the wedding, right? I'm feeling like a classic, yeah, like a classic succession wedding and a classic succession board meeting, perhaps. Oh, do you think they squeeze both into one episode? I don't know. No, I think that I think you're right that the board meeting gets delayed by Logan. Logan is busy meeting with Matt, and so there's a lot of questions about whether he's going to show up to the wedding. Mm. Um, Kendall falls off the wagon, maybe, maybe not. He, we kind of happened already in season one, so we don't need to have that one again in season. Yeah, four. I don't need to see him going on another bender. No one needs that, right? This could be this could be Willa's chance to have some histrionics. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think I do agree that the Gojo deal falls apart, but maybe not in like, I think maybe it's a two parter, right? Like this next episode is going to be all about the visit with Madsen Mm. and Logan's not going to be at the wedding, which is going to be like an emotional through line. If if Madsen is in Europe, then just logistically speaking... Logan can't. There, there won't even be that question of will he or won't he make the wedding because the minute that we see him in Italy or wherever, like that's it, he's not at the wedding. Yeah, which also, maybe, which maybe makes Connor do some like, I don't know, switching sides. I don't know how much like could that be a vote for like for the kids or could, or could like Connor's mum come out of the woodwork? <gasps> oh yeah, that would be amazing. <gasps> yeah, what a slap in the face. He's not even good to go to Connor's wedding, but he, like, threw that elaborate English wedding for Shiv, you know? Just... And Roman won't be at the wedding either, ostensibly, if he's going with yeah. Logan. Poor Connor. Yeah, Roman wants Roman wants to get in back in t- with Logan, but also actually genuinely wants to go to Connor's wedding. He has... Yeah. Poor Roman's conflicted. Everyone has terrible choices ahead of them. <laughs> <laughs> Become a billionaire or just stay really, really rich. Find out next week. <laughs> but there's no, there's yeah, there's no scenario in which they aren't all really, really rich by the end. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Right. No, all, totally. Yeah. Yeah. There's, yeah. It's like the difference between being a billionaire and a multi-billionaire. Well, it's the difference between having actual billions or hundreds of millions of money which you can spend versus being a passive shareholder with stock you can't sell in a company that you don't control. Right. You know, they they, they can still keep themselves in private jets but that it's not like 
they can't go out and buy peers. Right. Right. Yeah, there's limits, I guess. Boundaries that they can't cross. Yeah. Yeah. Keep us informed with all of your predictions. Slate money at slate.com. We want to know what you think is going to happen. Um, many thanks to Claire Malone for coming on. Thanks, Claire. It's thanks for having me. Awesome this was a lot of fun. having you. And yeah, thanks to Patrick Fort down in DC for producing. Thanks for Ben Richmond for doing all manner of clever button pushing in New York. We will be back on Saturday with a regular Slate Money and back the following Monday with yet more Slate Money Succession. Attention, everyone. I'm Alaska. And I'm Willem. Lawmakers, Puritans, bigots, and small-minded people are attacking our community, and we are ready to fight back. That's right. These conservative politicians are trying to tell the world that drag is bad. Well, we've got news for you, toots. Drag Drag is is good. good. So we're headed down to Tennessee to the iconic Play Nashville on April 13th to put on a live drag show fundraising event. Featuring us, Eureka O'Hara, Detox, The Meatball, and more. The fundraiser will raise money for the ACLU Drag Defense Fund to fight this legislation in court and mutual aid funds in Tennessee that benefit our queer and trans community who are under attack. For just $10, you can join our live stream and help fight the good fight. Visit moment.co slash drag is good for your live stream ticket. We have to stick together and show the world that trans lives matter. Queer people are everywhere and drag is good. Just between us. If you're looking for a new podcast, might I recommend our podcast? (laughs) Hi, I'm Gabe Dunn. And I'm Allison Raskin. We have a weekly show called Just Between Us, where we explore every kind of topic out there. From mental health, to sexuality, to animal behavior, to science. We love to interview fascinating people about their various expertise. We also answer listener questions and play a very silly game called hypotheticals. You're not going to want to miss it. It's unhinged. (laughs) And if you don't want to trust our word for it because it's our show, you should know that the iHeart Podcast Awards nominated us for Best Ensemble for 2023. That means that we are good at our jobs. Or we have good chemistry. Ooh. Ooh. So check out Just Between Us every Wednesday.